Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another evening of the UCSB Natural Reserve System Fall Seminar Series. Um, you guys are in for a treat tonight. We are over at Sedgwick Reserve, and we have a super exciting speaker for you all, which who I will introduce in just a few minutes. Um, but before we really dig in and get started on our presentations tonight, um, I first wanted to start with just a little bit of housekeeping, explain how the program will run tonight and how you, the audience, can interact with us. Um, and uh, also just a, a, a little explanation of how the Q&A works as well. Um, so uh, first, this evening's presentation will be recorded and uh, afterwards will be posted on the UCSB NRS YouTube page. So if uh, you didn't catch all of it tonight or you want to share it with your friends, that will be available um, in, the, in the next few days for you. Um, the other is that um, tonight's uh, uh, presentation will also be available in closed captioning. So for any of you folks who are out there and don't use Zoom that much, you can enable closed captioning by uh, 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 toggling the closed captioning button that says live transcript on the bottom of your screen. Um, tonight's presentation, um, we will start out with a little bit of a, a introduction to Cedric Reserve, and we're going to tell you about all the great things that are going on there. And then after that, we will um, get to our speaker who will give us a about a 20, 25 minute presentation on the research that she conducts at Cedric Reserve. And um, I think you'll, you're all in for a, a really great, great talk tonight. After our speaker um, uh, finishes, then we will open it up to you all through our Q&A session. And the way that you do that, again, look at the bottom of your screen, there's a little button that says Q&A, and you can type your questions in, and we will um, ask our speaker to answer your questions as you type them. So really looking forward to that with all of you. All right, so um, I, uh, you all get the, um, <laughs> the, the treat of hearing me um, give a presentation about what's going on at Sedgwick Reserve. And let me share my screen here. Okay, so Cedric Reserve, this is a lovely, beautiful picture. It gives you a little glimpse of what the reserve is like. And I wanted to start out by just telling you a little bit about the reserve. Cedric Reserve is one of seven reserves that the UC Santa Barbara campus oversees. And this is part of the 41 site natural reserve system, which is a UC wide uh, initiative that uh, puts lands aside for the purposes of research, university level education, public service and land stewardship. Sedgwick is a really special place and you can see it here um, on your screen. It's uh, outlined in this white border here. Um, we're just about 30 miles northwest of the city of Santa Barbara, and we're located in Santa Barbara County in what's called Santa Inez Valley. The reserve itself is extraordinary. It's about 6,000 acres, approximately nine square miles. And we've got a good elevation range there from about 950 to 2,600 feet uh, in elevation. Um, not a lot of precipitation. We get about 15 inches annually, although I guess depending on where you're coming from, that may be a lot. Um, it gets hot and it gets cold out there in Sedgwick. And I've seen frost in the winters and I've definitely baked out there in the summers. But one thing that's really great about Sedgwick is really all the, the researchers and students that come to use the reserve. Since 1997, which is when the reserve became part or when Sedgwick became part of the natural reserve system, there's been over 60,000 visitors, and this includes over 6,000 researchers, 8,000 university students, and 10,000 K through 12 students. It's a really busy place. But really, what really makes Sedgwick run are our amazing staff, faculty, and volunteers. And I'm sure a lot of you out there have met a lot of these great folks. We have a small and mighty team, uh, and they really do what they can to take care of that 6,000 acre property to really facilitate the research and all the classes that come out and use the reserves. Um, our, our staff uh, really work tires, tirelessly and they have conservation and they have ecology 
and preservation in mind. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be able to work with all of these folks. Not just staff though, we have a lot of volunteers that really do a lot of the hard work that um, for no pay, you know, um, but they really just enjoy being around and we value them so much um, as part of the fabric of the reserve. Uh, the staff are so good <clears throat> that they're actually beginning to train the bears to uh, manage our water systems out there. And so uh, they're not quite there yet. Um, well, I'm just kidding, but these are, this is a photo that I really particularly love that was taken recently at one of the um, water troughs at Sedgwick of a mama bear and her two baby bears coming to get a sip. So maintaining our, our water, all of our water infrastructure, but also our camera traps and, and a lot of the other ways that we um, like to observe our wildlife that use the reserve for all of their um, needs, water in this case. Um, Sedgwick is a really diverse place. There's a lot of different ecological communities um, for researchers, students, um, and, and members of the public to study, visit, and enjoy. Um, some of our communities include oak woodlands, annual grasslands, coastal sage scrub, and chaparral. And again, here are a few photos from Sedgwick that really just give you a sense of, of what it looks like out there. We have a great deal of biodiversity at Sedgwick, and uh, I challenge you to come to Sedgwick and, and not, you know, spy one of these little critters while you're out there. Um, of, of note right now, you'll see the big kind of hairy tarantula in the upper right. Um, I like to put that up because it's just about Halloween and um, tarantulas are, you know, they're not that spooky, but some people might think they're kind of spooky, but October, September and October is really their time that they're kind of coming above ground and um, you can see them, you know, really looking for a mate while they're out there. Um, and you can see a lot of these other um, animals and, and researchers and students and visitors come and like to either enjoy or study um, a lot of these species there too. Um, this is a busy slide, but really what I wanted to show you was that we have just so much research going on at Sedgwick and we're, we're very fortunate to be a place that really draws in a wide variety of different kinds of research that are out there. And it ranges from, you know, microbial research to herbivores to, um, you know, eDNA studies, climate sensitivity. Um, we've got uh, climatologists um, and atmospheric scientists. You can see in this photo on the right, it looks like there's some folks kind of sitting around throwing a balloon up in the air, but really this is some high-tech equipment that um, really measures properties of our atmosphere so that um, researchers, faculty from UCSB uh, can really understand the dynamics of sundowner winds, which is um, uh, you know, an important um, feature of our local region here. A lot of this, a lot of the research that happens at Sedgwick is through the Lacretz Research Center at Sedgwick Reserve, which is an extraordinary uh, opportunity for us at the reserve. This is a philanthropically endowed center um, brought to us by uh, uh, Morton Lacretz and Linda Lacretz Duttenhaver. And this really affords the opportunity to focus our research, re focus research that happens at Sedgwick on Sedgwick and the things that we're concerned about. Professor Frank Davis of the UCSB Bren School is the director of the Lacretz Research Center at Sedgwick. We have a lot of educational use as well. Um, we have both K through 12 education and university level education. And K through 12 education is a really special thing at Sedgwick. You know, this is an opportunity for, for young kids to, to get out and have those immersive experiences at Sedgwick. They can get their hands on things, they can get dirty and dusty, um, and they can also learn really from a young age about um, what nature's classroom is and, and really the beginning of what the scientific process is. We have about 300 students per year from kindergarten through 12th grade and that come to Sedgwick and that's uh, thanks in large part to our partnership with Nature Track. Um, university level education is also a, a really um, important part of what we do at Sedgwick, what we facilitate at Sedgwick. And we've got about 400 undergraduate and graduate students that come to Sedgwick as part of their classes uh, just in this year alone. Um, again, it's a really popular place to do that. We're only about 45 minute drive from the UCSB campus and a, a great deal of other community colleges and CSUs and other um, institutes of higher education in California and also from outside of California too. 
uh, public use. Um, Cedric uh, not only serves researchers and, and educators and students, but there's a lot of great um, things going on with our with the public. Uh, in spring 2022, uh, we were fortunate to be able to host the Prescribed Burn Association meeting. This was a, a gathering place for um, prescribed burn and fire practitioners across the state. Um, they could get together there and, and really, again, be outdoors, be in the, uh, in the environment. They can um, you know, receive training um, through their classes that they were holding there, and also really just get together and talk there. Um, in March of this year, we also hosted a work, uh, sorry, excuse me, an oak workshop, which we co-hosted with the San Inez Valley Natural History Society. Uh, this was an opportunity um, which was led by our docents and staff and volunteers to really understand, you know, um, oaks and, and what they mean to our area. And finally, we have a, a great public hike program at Sedgwick, which is very popular. And um, those, those occur regularly throughout the year, of course, when it's not too hot. Uh, one thing that, that we're really focusing on now, which is on a lot of people's minds, I'm sure, is wildfire and wildfire research, resilience, and safety. And those are a lot of big words, but let me just explain a little bit of what I mean. Um, you know, before I mentioned that the Prescribed Burn Association um, had held their meeting at Sedgwick, and this is a great way to kind of network with the fire practitioners that are out there. Um, we're also partnering with the Nature Conservancy through their TREX program, which is a prescribed fire training exchange. And this is essentially a, a, a training program that provides experiential training to build robust local capacity for fire management and offers professional fire practitioners a more holistic perspective while implementing treatments that support both the community and the landscape perspectives. Um, we've held um, some prescribed burns at Sedgwick before. You can see uh, some of the, the photos of that there on the right. Um, we work with Santa Barbara County Fire um, and a whole slew of researchers to come out and um, really study uh, what the effects of prescribed burn are, how to conduct them and so forth. We are also, um, we take the, the, the stewardship of our land very seriously. And um, we were so grateful this year to uh, be able to purchase uh, what's called a, a water truck or a water tender. And this is the truck on the left that you see. And this was made possible by some generous gifts from our donors and supporters out there. And what this truck can do for us is, is help us to increase our, our fire safety uh, on the reserve. It helps us maintain our roads as well. Um, and, uh, and, and just a really great all around tool for both the reserve and the community around us. Uh, we wanted to make an announcement. So we at Sedgwick have a really extraordinary docent program, docents and volunteers. And the docent program really started when the reserve started uh, 25 years ago. And there are some docents that were there in that inaugural class that are still with us today. And so we're thrilled to announce that we're opening up space for new docents at Sedgwick Reserve. And the docent program is really central to our mission uh, in the UC Natural Reserve System. And we use this program to educate the public on the importance of scientific study and wise stewardship of the earth. So we're encouraging you to please join our program. Um, we have a community of more than 50 docents who participate in diverse service and outreach activities on the reserve, including leading our public hikes. The photo on the right shows one of our, our more recent uh, events that we had, which is a full moon hike at Sedgwick. So if you would like to get more information on, on joining the docent core at Sedgwick, then please contact Nikki Evans. Uh, she is our outreach and communications specialist and her email address is here below. And finally, Sedgwick, we are celebrating this year. So it is Sedgwick's 25th anniversary as part of the UC Natural Reserve System. And what an exciting thing it is. Um, I could you know, probably talk for a couple hours about how the uh, Cedric Reserve became a part of the UC NRS, but we don't have time for this. But I thought this article um, that was published in 1997, one of the Santa Barbara newspapers was, was really kind of great and exciting to see. Cedric Ranch is saved. And like so much of what goes on here in Santa Barbara, when the community gets together and, and really wants to support a good idea, then things can happen. And I think that happened here at Sedgwick too. So uh, 
We are uh, just so thrilled to be able to celebrate this anniversary this year. And one way that we are going to do that is um, at our annual barn dance. And so please join us. It is this Saturday, November 5th, or sorry, is this, this November uh, on Saturday, November 5th. Um, and it is a great time. Um, you come on out to Sedgwick, we've got a, a collar. And even if you've got two left feet, I promise you, you will be able to do the square dancing that we have at the Sedgwick Barn Dance. This year, again, and, and this is part of our 25th anniversary celebration, um, we have uh, been able to get um, John Iwerks to produce some amazing artwork. And John Iwerks was actually a part of the crew that also created a lot of the art and imagery that was so key to having Sedgwick become part of the UC Natural Reserve System. So here's a little, a little uh, just sample of, of what um, John's art looks like. And here's also just a sample on the left of you know, the smiling faces of the barn dance. So please join us and purchase your ticket today. Okay, I think that's the last of these slides. And so now without further ado, what I will do next is to introduce our speaker. And um, you, we are amongst um, a very extraordinary scientist today. Um, Dr. Dana Chadwick um, is an earth system scientist and Dana works with the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And what Dana studies is she researches the interconnections among ecosystems, critical zone processes, and the evolution of landscapes. She uh, has an extraordinary background. She got both a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Science from the University of California, Berkeley. And I also am a Cal alum, so hooray, go bears. <laughs> um, both of her degrees were in, uh, one was in environmental economics and policy, the other was in molecular and cell biology. And um, talk about impressive, that's really amazing to be able to cover really such an amazing um, breadth of, of, of subjects there. From Berkeley, she uh, unfortunately went on to Stanford. Um, so we won't hold her to that, but she got a PhD, her PhD at Stanford in Earth System Science. Uh, after that, um, Dana was a postdoctoral researcher at um, University of Texas at Austin, or University of Texas at Austin, uh, and an and NSF postdoctoral fellow as well. Um, and so without further ado, Dana, I will turn it over to you and thank you for your presentation tonight. Absolutely, well, thank you so much um, for your kind introduction and the awesome introduction to Sedgwick. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk today about a project that took place this spring uh, that was kind of a collaboration between uh, some a bunch of folks at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and uh, Sedgwick Reserve and uh, Dangerman Preserve. And so I'm going to kind of take you uh, both into what we were doing really specifically at Sedgwick, but and then kind of back out to the broader uh, kind of larger goals of the project and then back into a bunch of kind of examples of, of projects that are kind of spinning off from this uh, this large effort that happened. Um, and uh, I, oh, I'm going to try to move my slides forward here. Um, uh, and I, oh, but before I get started, I want to acknowledge up front all of the amazing people that really helped to make this happen. And I was, you know, kind of perusing the participants list uh, right before I uh, jumped on. And I know that many of you are here today. And so I'm thrilled that, um, thrilled to have you here. And uh, yeah, so um, the the project that I want to, I'm, I'm here to tell you about is called the SPG High Frequency Time Series Project. And uh, it's a project where we flew a sensor based at JPL called Avaris over uh, this, the areas shown here in Santa Barbara County um, for kind of 14 consecutive weeks during the spring and paired that with a bunch of groundwork. Uh, and there's a lot of things in there that I'm going to need to break down and explain for you, including uh, what is Avaris and what is SVG and what do these acronyms mean. Um, so we're going to take it one step at a time, and I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about the um, airborne instruments that were used to kind of collect uh, these really interesting uh, airborne data sets uh, that are you know, now going to be available, both for this area that includes Sedgwick Reserve kind of here in the center, but also um, it captures a couple of the other UC reserves and 
including um, coal oil point and the carburetor salt marsh as well. So Avarice. Avarice is the instrument that is uh, on board the airplane that flew uh, to collect these data. And Avarice is an imaging spectrometer. So what that means is that it's basically um, a very fancy camera. And it's a camera in the same way that your red, green, blue iPhone is a camera. So it's uh, basically taking light that is reflected from the sun. Um, the light comes in through the atmosphere and it interacts with uh, whatever's on the surface and the surface leaves basically a fingerprint on that light and that light then gets reflected back and gets observed by the instruments that are in this plane. So uh, the instrument is here on the left and it has a whole bunch of accompanying uh, hardware to store the data and uh, basically control the sensor at the same time. So it's a um, it's a whole uh, production. <laughs> and what we are able to capture from that is uh, this information about how light has interacted with the surface and reflected back um, into like to the what the sensor ends up seeing. And so what you see here is that um, this portion of the spectrum, basically from like 450 here, um, is the visible portion of the spectrum. So this is what we can see with our eyes. And your camera would capture basically three points, red, green, and blue, across that portion of the spectrum. But this sensor is designed so that it sees not only this visible portion of the spectrum, it also sees this whole area, which is the near infrared, and two portions of the shortwave infrared. And you see these gaps here are areas where the lights actually interfere, the atmosphere interferes with the light in that area. So we don't really know anything about what the surface reflectance looks like there. Um, this is basically um, a hyperspectral sensor. Some people often hear of those. And basically what that means is that instead of those kind of discrete red, green, and blue, this sensor is actually capturing um, immediately adjacent wavelengths at about five nanometer increments all the way across the spectrum, which means that we have about 420 different bands instead of just the three that you get with red, green, blue that we can use to kind of untangle and understand things about the surface properties of, um, of whatever portion of the Earth's surface we're looking at with this instrument. And so these are some examples of what that ends up looking like. Um, so here we have um, in green, uh, healthy green vegetation. Um, you see this um, portion of the spectrum here is where chlorophyll absorbs a lot of light. Um, you then, as vegetation uh, starts to get stressed and starts to senesce, you end up um, with this kind of yellowish curve. So it's not looking quite as happy. There's not a, as much reflectance in the near infrared. Um, and then as soon as the vegetation actually starts to die, it kind of looks more like this brown um, uh, spectrum here. And so, you know, what you can see here is that there's a variety of different changes that happen in the spectrum over the course of moving from very healthy and live vegetation to very unhappy and dead vegetation. And, you know, depending on the sensor that we have, we can really start to understand some of the dynamics that are happening, you know, as you uh, move through, you know, from the spring when everything's very green into the summer when everything's very dry. And for those of you that you know have thought about satellite data before, this is just to give you a sense that these are the areas where our kind of existing satellites are, are capturing data from. So if you've heard of MODIS or Landsat, some of these products that result in these large land cover maps, um, you know, oftentimes they're capturing like one piece of information here, one here, one here, one here, you know, so they're um, and these are called multispectral instead of hyperspectral instruments. And so what you can see is that you know, by capturing this full amount of the spectrum, we are getting a, a, you know, a giant step change, basically, in what we're able to understand about the Earth's surface. Um, and so this is really exciting. And what we've been able to do, because we have this uh, very highly time-resolved data, is that we're able to look in even more detail where every week we can start to see that change. And so this is an example of a, a single location, a grassland at Sedgwick um, up by the airstrip for those of you that, uh, that have been in the area. And um, 
what you see is that, you know, early in the season, there wasn't much change in these spectra, but then they're kind of hit this turning point when everything started to senesce. And then they, this whole spectrum really started to change until all the way the grass was dead at the end of, uh, at the end of that spring season. Um, and so, you know, I think this is interesting because I'm a spectral nerd, but you might be like, okay, I'm not really sure why I would care about this. Um, so to give you an idea, there's a variety of things that that level of spectral information can tell us. Um, and so one of those things would be information about the plant, plant species or the vegetation community composition in a given location. Um, it also might tell us something about the uh, health of the vegetation and kind of the biochemical properties of the leaves. And then finally, it also might tell us something about the vegetation water contents and how that's changing through time, um, which can be really interesting and important as these, um, uh, you know, as the annuals uh, senesce, but then also as, um, uh, as vegetation gets stressed, you know, as we you know we're in a drought right now. And so as things really dried down and it got very hot, how much kind of change in water content there end up being in some of these ecosystems. So, but to basically in, in order to get um, uh, from those spectra that I showed you to these kind of more interpretable and, uh, and perhaps useful to you um, maps and spatial understanding, we have to basically start with understanding the linkages between the avarice acquisitions that we got and what's happening on the ground. Um, and so this is where working at Sedgwick was really, really fantastic. So what you see on the left here is uh, avarice acquisitions that occurred uh, in February. So this is the first one that occurred in February 24th, and then the last one that occurred in uh, May 29th. And well, not the very last one. We did do one all the way in the fall. But of the main time series, these are the first and the last. And what you can see, of course, is that there were some grasslands here that were very happy uh, in February that by the time we got to May, we're no longer so happy. Um, but throughout this whole period, we went out as a team um, many of you, or at least several of you are here, uh, and collected information about the um, species cover and composition. Um, we collected uh, samples from the tops of trees so that we could do biochemical analyses and kind of assess the health of the vegetation um, and kind of tried to capture generally kind of the state of the ecosystem at, at every given week for the different sites that we went to. Um, and here's where, of course, I'll give a good shout out to uh, Frank Davis, who uh, who was mentioned earlier for uh, keeping us on the straight and narrow and uh, teaching us all about the plant uh, species and communities that exist at Sedgwick. And so we were so we were working on kind of collecting that and matching it really closely with the airborne data. And to give you a sense of what we were able to accomplish, these are the, this is a, a figure courtesy of Frank, uh, that shows um, the sampling date. So we sampled, uh, you know, every week across this time series, kind of all around Sedgwick and up into Figueroa Mountain area. Um, and so not only did we do this kind of groundwork, but we took then samples back to the lab where we did some additional um, work to assess uh, basically how thick the leaves were, how tough they are, uh, do some measurements of chlorophyll content, and then kind of as we were going, keep a, a record of the geolocation of each um, sample that we were taking so that we could then be linking it back to its kind of spectral partner from the airborne data. So that's um, kind of the big picture of the baseline of what we were doing at Sedgwick. Um, but that doesn't really tell you much about why or kind of the goal of the project. But I wanted to give you that kind of background perspective so that we can we can dive in a little bit here. So kind of I've I've been thinking of it that we had kind of four goals associated with uh, the shift project. And part of it was missions, part of it was research, applications, and community. And um, I'll start out here by talking about mission because it allows me to answer the question of what is SBG? <laughs> um, NASA and JPL love their acronyms. So this shift is an acronym that contains an acronym within it, which is just great. Um, so 
SBG is the Surface Biology and Geology uh, Mission. And so it's part of the recently announced Earth System Observatory that uh, is part of NASA's kind of new Earth observation uh, platform. So it consists of these kind of five different areas of focus and surface biology and geology is here. Um, and is it's a mission that's slated to be launched in 2027 or 2028. Uh, and the this is, you know, a lot of technical stuff on here, but um, it is basically a um, a mission that's going to have two platforms. So one of them is going to be the thermal infrared, which I'm not going to talk so much about um, in this particular presentation, but the other one is a vSphere sensor. And so it's very much like Avarice. In fact, it's going to be made by the same lab that made Avarice, uh, most likely. And so it's one of the big questions that we have associated with planning for this mission is, you know, here there's it's estimated that this will have a 16-day revisit. So it'll pass over any given portion of the planet every 16 days. And when it does that, what it's going to see is, you know, all kinds of things that are going to be awesome. <laughs> so ecosystems, agriculture, coastal zones, you know, all of these different kinds of areas. And, you know, a lot of these um, portions of the planet's surface are changing quite rapidly. And so a big question is, is that what is that 16 day repeat going to get us? Like, how much are we going to be able to see and how fast are kind of is the surface of the earth changing in relation to that you know 16 day repeat so the reason really that the shift kind of campaign came into being in the first place is that there wasn't a data set that we could really use to think about this so you know oftentimes when people fly avarice like it's you know for a specific reason in a certain place one time and when people are looking at ecosystems, they're often thinking, okay, I want to be doing this at the peak greenness time. So I get kind of the most information about how the vegetation health and status. But, um, but that doesn't really help you understand kind of how that vegetation is changing over time, or if you've caught, you know, something at its peak greenness, but maybe something else is actually, you know, senescing, or maybe it's just starting to bloom. So this was a very cool way of being able to start to expand um, our perspective through time instead of just across space. So the question from a mission perspective was really this like, how much information do we gain from repeat? And so I'm going to show you some preliminary results here. Um, but one of the ways that we can think about this is to essentially say, okay, how much information content essentially do these data contain um, you know, either just at a single date, uh, when you take it and look from, you know, the first date till the very last date, how much additional information do you get from having those two time points, like three months apart, um, you know, and then you can kind of continue. So you add another time point in and you add another time point in, and then you can kind of build this understanding of how much complexity there is in this system. Of course, these sensors, you know, there's a lot of things that can potentially affect them. And so in this case, there was, um, this was work that was done by an intern at JPL, Michael, Michael Kuyper, um, and his mentors, uh, Phil Broderick and Carrie Cox Nicholson. Um, and so what they did was they used a background noise, kind of noise information that they gathered from this mining site in the area to kind of Get a sense of how much is the spectra changing just from like differences in atmosphere, differences in lighting, all kinds of things that can be very hard to control for. So they were interested in thinking about, you know, okay, lots of systems might change differently. So they selected a, a variety of, of locations to look at. So rocks and parking lots and roofs that might not change as much through time one would expect potentially. Um, and then trees and shrubs and grasslands, which we might think would be changing more. And so um, some of their initial results basically say that, so as you go from just a single time point to increasing your observation frequency, um, or sorry, decreasing your observation frequency. So here, we're here at about 16 days, which is about the, um, 
estimated uh, repeat of SVG. And what you see is that the information content is kind of stopped increasing for parking lots. So there's not that much change going on at the 16 day, after you get past 16 days for parking lots, frankly, after you get past 30 days. Um, for rocks, it also has started to taper off. For rooftops, started to taper off here. But then it's interesting because you see that the grasslands, shrubs, and trees, like they just kind of continue to become, like to gain more information as we collect more of these data. Um, so this was a really interesting thing to see. And it's kind of uh, speaks to the trade-off that needs to be made whenever you're designing a mission. Like maybe you would love to sample every single day, but you still do get a lot of information at the 16-day mark. And in fact, SVG is working to partner with ESA, the um, European Space Agency, to condense that down so that in fact it's um, every week between the two instruments that they're both planning to put up that have kind of similar characteristics. So this was a really fun result to see. Um, and then we're going to be continuing to kind of work on doing this type of analysis. And then there's a bunch of exciting research that's going to uh, come out of these data. And one of those things is just really looking basically at how vegetation changes through time. And so this is uh, basically a false color image. And it's uh, Sedgwick in the middle here. If you can kind of, uh, this is the this is the headquarters area right down here. And what you're seeing is um, basically kind of a series of indices for how vegetation is changing. And um, so LMA in red, both in the image and on the graphs, um, is kind of increasing through time. Um, and leaf LMA stands for leaf mass per area. So it's kind of an indicator basically of how, um, how thick leaves are, how much plants have invested in their leaves at that point. Um, leaf water content is in green and um, that's declining, which makes sense because all of these uh, plants are senescing. And then uh, nitrogen, is kind of staying interestingly uh, flat through time. This is on average kind of over the grassland sites and the tree sites that we collected. So there's a lot of variability that's happening kind of at kind of within each of these, but it gives you kind of a general sense of what's going on. Though I would like to point out that it's very fun for those of you that know the Sedgwick area, if you kind of go and look through this area here, this is one of the riparian zones right as you come into the uh, Sedgwick Reserve and these plants really green up much later in the spring. So the riparian zones are really on this like different phenological time cycle. And so you see them like really start to shine and, and green up and increase their nitrogen and water content um, as you kind of move through the season. So it's fun to see that, you know, not everywhere has the same kind of peak greenness or green up experience, which is kind of, you know, part of the beauty of this project was to really be able to see that, you know, okay, if you chose the time when the grasses are all green, it might not be when the trees are all green. So we're able to kind of get a deeper uh, understanding from this. And then I'll also just mention briefly that some of the collaborators on this project are working on thinking about um, vegetation stress through time, especially in the face of this drought. So I'll, um, do a uh, shout out to Lee Andreg, who's a uh, relatively new professor at UC Santa Barbara, and Elsa Ordway, who's at UCSB. Um, and uh, this is these are a set of trees in that kind of red area there uh, in Liskay, uh, where they have ongoing monitoring happening. So they're monitoring some sap flow sensors, and they went out several times during the course of the project to uh, basically see what the water status of the trees were. Were they really stressed? Were they really thirsty? Um, and, you know, that looks like doing, taking a bunch of samples and seeing, you know, this is called a, a pressure bomb, <laughs> which, which it sounds more exciting than it is, um, perhaps. Uh, and, you know, these are kind of the instruments that they use to assess how, um, how stressed these trees were. Uh, and, Lee has found that, you know, for these, so this is the same kind of set of trees here that he's seeing here and that he's looking at both blue oaks and coast live oaks uh, in, uh, in blue and red here. And this was the kind of how, like basically how big these dots are, are essentially how stressed 
the trees are. And so this is the difference between April and July of this year. So, and the ones that were in circles here are extremely stressed. This is the level at which they think that they, these trees may actually be starting to die. And so we're gonna keep watching them. They're gonna keep watching them um, for the coming years and, and see if they're able to recover. And you know, the, um, the heat wave that we had in, uh, in the late fall was really uh, unfortunate and probably not great for these guys. Um, but we're gonna be able to at least record this and, and continue to monitor kind of how they were able to, uh, to maintain themselves or not during this time. Yes, as I said, those trees are very sad. Um, and so then there's some uh, different types of um, different types of applications that people are focused on. So there's um, a project that's uh, being done by a grad student at uh, University of uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and she's looking at actually that this is actually the area that um, Marion just showed that was being burned previously. Uh, you can see it in Google Earth imagery here. And um, so there's uh, some areas here that were burned and grazed, uh, burned but not grazed, and then some areas that were uh, neither burned nor grazed. And so we, as part of this, uh, data collection, we went out and we were taking pictures from above so we could kind of get a sense of um, what was the green vegetation cover so we can be relating that to the airborne data and kind of expand this understanding out. But one of the things that you see here is just basically a, a ungrazed and unburned patch. So there's a lot of thatch that's happening in this site. And then an ungrazed and burned, and then a grazed and burned site. And so what you can really see here is that, you know, this is all the same time of year. This, these were in fact all collected on the same day. Um, but this ungrazed and unburned site has a lot more thatch and dry mat, uh, kind of dry grass matter from previous years. And so it's interesting to see this and we'd like to understand kind of how widespread this is under what conditions um, and you know, kind of get an understanding of what how this might be related to fire dynamics, things like this. So we'll be looking forward to hearing more from uh, Natalie Quayley as uh, as she conducts her research. And then I would also love to uh, highlight Herman um, Silva, who's a member of Dar Roberts Lab in the geography department, um, as well as Jennifer Kings. And uh, they are looking at uh, wetland kind of biogeochemical recovery. So this is a project that's actually at Coal Oil Point and um, North Campus Open Space, but I wanted to throw it in here as another example of a, a, a very cool graduate student uh, research project that is close to the UCSB community. Um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing some of the results of their work as well. And then I'll come to community because um, this is my favorite part, so best for last. Um, and I just want to thank uh, so many folks. Uh, we were able to really pull in a lot of early career faculty and their students, which who were really excited about participating in this project. Um, we were able to, Erin Hester is from uh, UC Merced, actually, and uh, she was able to put out one of her uh, ground truthing instruments at uh, the Sea Center, the uh, Santa Barbara National History Museum Sea Center, um, and, you know, they made a poster for public engagement there, which was really fun if any of you were able to see that when that was there. Um, you know, it was really nice to be able to try to connect folks um, you know, we worked some with the USGS and kind of brought them in and engaged, tried to keep engaging across uh, students and uh, professionals in different lines of work. And then um, it was uh, really great. Uh, Claire Feike also in DARS lab really made an effort to get Vina Chu's undergrad class out to come and see what we were up to. Um, and we ran into uh, Mark Mays' class out there. So we were able to kind of engage a little bit even past the group of um, uh, graduate and, and undergrad students that were able to uh, be directly involved with the project. Um, and then so this is just kind of a list of the people who, you know, I always want to be sure to thank for all of their awesome work. Uh, so, you know, Sedgwick folks, of course, absolutely. Um, and then, you know, it was really great. We were able to get out to the Carbon Rate Salt Marsh. Thank you to Andy Brooks for, uh, for hosting us there. Um, 
And uh, yeah, and you know, to the many, many UCSB folks that uh, that came out and participated and supported us, it, uh, you know, it was it was super great. Uh, for those of you that know Dar Roberts, here he is amongst the youth, um, and uh, and Frank Davis up here as well. So, um, so yeah, so it's really cool to me that this project that has this, you know, kind of spans from this you know, kind of essential groundwork for SBG, this like satellite mission that's years in the future, all the way down into this kind of day-to-day -day work in the field with folks, uh, you know, at Sedgwick. Um, and, you know, just kind of that relationship between this like space <laughs> and like, and the research and, you know, applications in a broader context. This is something I didn't talk about, but there's a big ice plant invasion in the Nature Conservancy's Dangerman preserve that we're also kind of engaging with them with mapping and thinking about how to help manage that system. Um, and then just this this fantastic community that you that you all have here and that I was so lucky to be a part of. Um, and so then of course I want to uh, put a huge thank you to Sedgwick Reserve and, and the folks there. Liza and Brenda kept us uh, kept us on the rails all the time. Um, Frank and the Lacrette Center just fabulous hosts, um, and I couldn't be more grateful. And so I didn't know that slide was going to advance, but there you have it. <laughs> so I guess that's it, and that should leave us plenty of time for questions, I hope. And thank you all for being here this evening. I know it's late. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Dana. Um, Dana, if you want to pull down your slides, then we'll dig into the Q&A session. Um, first of all, thank you for that super exciting talk. We've got a couple questions already in the Q&A. Before I get to them, I just want to give everyone a little reminder. Um, you know, Use your Q&A button at the bottom. Go ahead and type your questions in, and we will try to get to them. Um, OK, so uh, I uh, will start with a question from Erica Dale. And Erica asks, is there any reason you were doing plane flyovers for this data collection instead of using satellite data? And I think you touched on that a little bit, but maybe you can um, expand a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there really aren't uh, satellite data that could do this yet. So this was kind of the best that we could do to simulate what satellite data will be like when we have these types of sensors. Um, and so we will be doing some comparisons with existing satellites to kind of understand the additional information that we gain from having this hyperspectral data that's so much more uh, spectrally resolved than things like Landsat. Um, but uh, it's a great question and, and people do use existing satellite data for phenological studies, but we're really trying to get at the value of this really high uh, spectral resolution data in particular. Um, okay, so this question um, comes from uh, Kristen Lewis, and you described during your talk, um, there's there seem to be so many different um, researchers, students, stakeholders involved. Um, Kristen asks, is anyone studying the arthropod populations in relation to the changes in plant communities over time? Um, not that I'm aware of. We, um, we had an undergrad out um, Athena, who was very excited about uh, the insects and checking them out and collecting them, but I, I don't think that she is um, specifically working on any projects related to uh, kind of linking with the ship data. Uh, I will say that some folks did put out um, uh, audio moths, uh, and uh, which are basically just like sound sensors to understand, you know, and they're related to like amphibians, so like frog noises and birds and those distributions. Um, and they tried to cite them in areas where we were doing some of our ground sampling as well. And so there's some interest in kind of trying to link, you know, some of that information about, you know, more fauna with the, uh, with the kind of phenology of the vegetation that we're detecting. So I'll, I'll be excited to see what people end up doing with that. Excellent. Okay, so um, this is a question from Dennis Beebe, and Dennis asks, what is the ground resolution of an airborne sensor? And then he phrases oh. the question in a different way too. And he says, could you focus on just one species of oak tree knowing their location? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And I totally should have said that and, and missed it. Um, but yes, the ground resolution was um, five meter uh, pixels. Generally, we have a few, a couple smaller areas that we flew at about one to two meter resolution specifically over the lower part of Sedgwick Reserve. Mm -hmm. um, so with the five meter pixels, we'll be able to do species identification on larger trees, like the valley oaks, some of the coast live oaks. Um, absolutely. Uh, when we get down to that one meter data, then we'll definitely be able to kind of resolve at the tree level, most likely shrub communities pretty well. Um, and then, of course, once you get into grasslands, those are still like too small to be able to get at kind of individual species, though we can get at things like uh, here's a huge patch of mustard, you know, most mostly mustard, right? So, um, so yeah. Okay, thank you, Dennis. Um, okay, so uh, this is a question about the riparian zone, which I was also very interested in too. This is from Laura Baldwin. And Laura says, super interesting. Thank you for your talk. Um, intriguing about the Sedgwick riparian trees greening up later in the year. Do you have data about when that portion of the creek had running surface water? Ooh, um, I believe that Sedgwick has that data. I don't, um, so hopefully uh, through our collaborations, we'll be able to, um, to kind of uh, get together with them on that. And I know that, I think I saw Connor's name on here, who's another one of Dar's grad students who's really interested in riparian zones. So, so perhaps he'll be having answers to that in the future. Excellent. So um, this is a question, maybe this is a good one to follow from Frank Davis. And um, Frank says, uh, SHIFT was a fantastic project and the SHIFT team made great use of the Cedric Reserve and the other UCSB NRS reserves. And uh, yes, how might the UCSB NRS or the Natural Reserve System contribute to SBG moving forward? Ooh, fun. Um, yeah, so I think that one of the things that's gonna be exciting is that at least, you know, for me, what I'm hoping is that we're going to kind of be able to develop some of these hub areas where we've collected a lot of these data and we can come back and continue to monitor them. And as SBG goes up, those will be places that we can base some of our kind of continued um, ground truthing and more intensive studies and encourage people to use them as kind of a base to build off of because there is this kind of enthusiasm and understanding and community that's been built around the um, kind of the uh, relationship between uh, Sedgwick and uh, and the JPL and SVG community. So um, I'd, I'm, I'd love to keep it going. <laughs> Well, we're here. We're here for you. So <laughs> give us a call. And there's, and uh, you know, outside of the UCSB uh, seven reserves, there's there's a whole slew of others. You know, that other campuses manage as well. So um, as long as you've got fuel for those airplanes, I think you can <laughs> somewhere to land. Somewhere to land. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm I'm actually going to ask a question that's a little bit um, about your personal trajectory. And oh, absolutely. Yeah. Maybe you could tell us, you know, there's, there's some students and, and, and uh, you know, myself included, um, just interested in like, um, how did you, how did you find this path? How did you get to, to your, your job where you are now? What interested you about this? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, it was kind of winding. I feel like sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm writing an application letter and I'll paint you this beautiful arc, but like, you know, it's always a little uh, stochastic. Um, I. Uh, yeah, out of undergrad, I um, I worked for several years uh, at a company that kind of dealt with renewable energy and carbon credits. And, um, you know, as I was doing it, that like, there was a lot of interesting things, especially around kind of forest land management that I thought was really interesting and that people were talking about kind of in the carbon space. And, you know, I... I transitioned from molecular biology to kind of uh, environmental economics because I was like, oh, it's too small. And I was kind of like, oh, it's too not related to nature. And so, um, you know, as I uh, as I wanted to go back to grad school, I kind of came back into, um, into thinking about this kind of ecosystem level processes and, you know, was focused on thinking about carbon at first. Um, and I found um, a lab that used these hyperspectral data and were like, it's, you know, you can do so much more than carbon, like there's so much more than just LIDAR, you can think about, you know, species and health and, you know, nutrients and all these other types of things. And so I just got really excited that like that was 
a possibility of something that you could do at these large scales where, you know, it's like you can never get to these, you know, you can never collect samples from all the trees in the landscape, right? And so, you, but you could still start to understand something about how they're functioning and what might be driving those processes. So, um, yeah, so I studied that in grad school and I kind of just kept plugging along and um, I did apply for faculty jobs for quite a while and, you know, none of those ever panned out and I saw this job opening at JPL and I was like, man, that looks just like me. And, uh, and so I've, uh, I've been there for just under a year now. And so, <laughs> sorry, I don't know if that was too personal or too not. I don't know. <laughs> Chaos. Oh, that, that was great. That was great. You know, we all, we all have, we all have kind of pathways like that. It's really great to hear. And it's also great to hear when you get a good fit. So I'm, I'm glad that this is, this is amazing. Um, I, you know, along those same lines to what, what advice might you have for, you know, undergraduate or graduate students at this, at this stage of their careers? Yeah, I mean, if you're excited about basically any of the things that I talked about here today, um, you are absolutely welcome to get in touch with me. Um, I show up in Google pretty easily if you <laughs> Google my name and JPL, um, my email's there. Um, there are also a lot of internship programs with uh, JPL and NASA. There is the Finesse program uh, that is a graduate fellowship program. There are postdoc programs through NASA. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think that there's, there's a lot of opportunities and I think um, with SBG coming up, there's a, you know, there's continues to be a lot of um, very interesting earth observation opportunities in places that kind of maybe traditionally thought more of Mars when you thought of them. So, um, so, okay. yeah, and I think the internship program seems like it's a really great program. I mean, I have only been there for like, as I said, like, you know, 10 or 11 months, but uh, we bring in tons of undergrads and, and grads through that program. So, um, yeah. Very neat, very neat. Well, I think we have time for um, maybe one more question. Um, and this is a question from Wayne Farron. And uh, Wayne says, Cedric Reserve has many unique but small habitats such as vernal pools, um, seeps and springs and special serpentine outcrops. These are within the five meter resolution. And he asks, were some of these sites included in the sampling protocols? They were um, it, for explicitly that reason, that, that, that those were sites that we wanted to be sure that we captured so that we could um, you know, kind of understand their extent and how they might be different. Um, and in fact, one of those, uh, the, one of the kind of vernal pool areas, uh, I was looking at the, how the spectra changed through the year and it starts out completely flat because water absorbs all the light and then it just like lifts up into this green vegetation and it's it's just very cool to see. So yes, we did sample those. We did sample in the serpentine outcrop areas quite a bit. Um, and we're really interested to see also how that really, you know, interesting and, and, and unique rock type uh, is gonna kind of come through in the vegetation kind of health and, um, and chemical components that we're gonna be exploring, so. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Dana, for this exciting talk tonight. Thanks to everybody out there in the audience for um, joining us today. Um, before Thank you, you for having me. <laughs> anytime, anytime, please come on back. And um, I, before we log out for the night, I wanted to just let everybody out there know that uh, next week we're actually taking a pause and we will not have um, our regular Tuesday night um, UCSB NRS seminar series presentation, but we'll be back the week after that on November 1st. And you, uh, are in for an exciting and different treat. Um, this talk is by Dr. Toby Hammer from UC Irvine, uh, and it's called Charting the Microbial World Within California's Bumblebees. And so I believe that we're going to lo be looking inside the, the gut of a bumblebee next time. So that is brought to us by our Valentine Eastern Sierra Reserve. Um, so please join us on November 1st. And again, uh, thank you for joining tonight, and everyone have a, a great rest of your evening. Thanks.